Hello, everybody. Okay, I see everybody trickling in. Come on in. I am Jen Sankovic. I am the executive director of SF City. I see we've got a lot of returning folks that are joining today. Today's gonna to be a really interesting conversation. Uh, we've been doing these COVID-19 effect talks for several months now, and we've talked about all kinds of different industries and how COVID has affected them and what the future is gonna look like. But I don't think there's anything that anyone has mentioned that has been more on the top of everyone's mind than food and restaurants. How on earth are we going to save San Francisco's restaurant industry? Food is a really big part of SF. It's a big part of our culture. Um, so I'm really excited for today's talk. Uh, we have the executive director of the Golden Gate Restaurant Association, Lori Thomas, and we're gonna be talking about what the future of San Francisco's restaurant food culture looks like. So without further ado, I am going to be going through some quick Q and A. Okay, thanks Zoom. Now we got better sound going. All right, quick housekeeping, Q and A. You're gonna see at the bottom that there is going to be a spot for us to do Q and A. Feel free to ask a question at any time throughout today's conversation. We're gonna be getting to as many questions as possible. So please throw it in the Q and A and Lori and I will get to it later in today's discussion. This webinar is being recorded. So if you really want to rewatch and get all these amazing details, we will send out to you the full recorded webinar for you to share with all of your friends and family and talk about how you guys are going to save your favorite restaurant in San Francisco. Lastly, I got to do the plug. So if you want to talk about today's discussion on social media, you can use the hashtag the COVID-19 effect and tag at SF City, S-F-C-I-T-I, -I, right there, right there. Okay, so before we get started for today's discussion, I'm going to do a quick overview of what on earth has been going on in San Francisco's restaurant industry. All right, let's bring that bad boy back up. Okay, so. We'll just start with, so who are we? So SF City is the Tech Trade Association here in San Francisco. We were founded back in 2012 to empower the San Francisco tech community to have a voice in tech policy decisions. We work with all kinds of different folks in San Francisco to make this the best place to live and work. And one of those folks, of course, is the restaurant industry. Um, that's a big part of this city, and we're really excited to have this conversation and talk about how we can build our way forward together. All right. One other quick plug is we actually do a COVID-19 update that happens every single Monday morning. So if you want to hear more about what the future of San Francisco's reopening looks like, please make sure to check out our COVID-19 update. Okay. So let's get to the TLDR. SF City published a blog covering the effect of COVID-19 on San Francisco's restaurants and food culture a few weeks back. Uh, in case you did not get a chance to read it, I'm gonna give you a short overview of what we talked about. Operating a restaurant is difficult. Even in the best of times, running a restaurant is risky, labor intensive, and really, really expensive. Uh, even I was shocked when Laurie and I spoke in the past uh, about what those margins really look like. In San Francisco, restaurateurs face even more challenges. They struggle to keep up with rising wages, dwindling labor pool, skyrocketing rent, and the bureaucratic maze that is the city of San Francisco's permitting system. Last year alone, 384 restaurants opened while 535 closed. The pandemic only created an even starker reality for San Francisco's beloved restaurant and food culture. 
During these unprecedented times, restaurateurs have had to stay nimble and flexible in order to stay afloat. I think we call that innovation. As the main source of income for restaurants disappeared overnight because of shelter in place, restaurateurs had to create new revenue streams. Restaurant owners were open to many new ideas. They shifted to large meal orders, including helping nonprofits to fill donated meal orders to first responders, low-income families, seniors, those experiencing homelessness. There's been some really, really cool partnerships um, actually that have gone on. Restaurateurs have also reinvented their menus to adjust to changing customer needs. That meant moving away from fine dining white tablecloth to a little bit more like fast casual or even to go options. I've actually seen some cool restaurants, including one of my favorites, offer meal kits uh, similar to Blue Apron or Hello Fresh, so you can recreate your favorite recipes at home. Though the go-to way to continue doing business during shelter in place was the very, very obviously takeout. Despite the fact that a majority of restaurant owners say they are losing money doing so, this has been what most restaurants have switched to. Even as restaurants in most parts of California have been reopened since May, San Francisco took a methodical and phased approach. We did it a little bit different in our city. Can you guys believe it? San Francisco allowed outdoor seating at restaurants to start on June 12th, and indoor seating won't be allowed until July 13th. In the age of COVID-19, implementing safety measures became the number one, two, and three priority for restaurants. Some of the safety measures from the nine pages of the California guidelines to reopening dining restaurants include supplying employees with PPE, definitely something we'll be talking about, leaving nothing on the table, training employees on prevention practices, posting signage about practicing physical distancing, and of course, using face coverings. These nine pages of guidelines are the standard for any restaurant to reopen in the state. In SF, in order for restaurant tours to capitalize on outdoor seating, the city had to streamline the wildly laborious permitting process. This led to the creation of the Shared Spaces Program, which expedited the permit process to legally operate and seat patrons in adjacent public spaces, including sidewalks, parking spaces, parklets, and patios. Even with the seating capacity reduced, being able to see people outside is going to be key to helping restaurants stay afloat during these times. I hear North Beach is really starting to get quite lively with this interesting new shared spaces program. As a collective group, restaurateurs have been slow to embrace and maximize technology. Good thing we're having this conversation. Technology will help make the overall process of operating a restaurant more efficient, effective, and scalable. As restaurateurs look to take their business to the next level, they need to make tech their best friend. Until the pandemic, they have not had their hands forced on this matter. The first step, is to start with basic improvements like updating the rest restaurant website to reflect accurate details about menu items. It also helps to make the website aesthetically pleasing and easy to navigate. Another low barrier step is for restaurants to set up contactless pay. In a time of safety concerns, this could prove to be highly beneficial. I don't know about any of you guys, but have you seen Square's stock prices lately? As the pandemic upended traditional means of getting customers to come into the store, restaurateurs turned to social media and digital marketing. These methods have made it easy for restaurateurs to notify their customers of changes or new promotions. Lastly, digitize the menu. This has become super popular. As reusable menus became unsanctioned due to COVID, menus wasted a lot of paper uh, in their disposable form, and so it made more sense to go digital. Whether on the company's website or accessible through a QR code placed on the table, this enables the customer to look at the menu on their own electronic device. The road to recovery will certainly be challenging. Hopefully we can come together to keep our restaurants alive. After all, restaurants represent so much more than food. Okay, that sounds like a pretty good summary of how we got to today. All right, I'm gonna pop back up here. Hello, hello everyone. Right before we bring up Lori, I'm gonna do a quick poll of the room. And you guys should see that popping up now. Okay, just take a second. Very curious to see who has still been eating out. 
Okay, y'all are all over the place on this. All right, we'll wait another few seconds if you want to get your say into the poll. Okay, all right. I will share the results. Good stuff. Lori Thomas, if you would like to come aboard, please, everybody, welcome Lori from GGRA. Uh oh, unable to start video. Can you start the video? <sighs> Jennifer? Thank you. Yeah. We'll start. Oh, now I can. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, all right, how's it going? Great, and thank you for having me, Jennifer. That was a, you pretty much answered all the questions. That was a great summary kickoff uh, slideshow. So but thank you all go home now. You're done. Yeah, all good. <laughs> Very uh, well done. How's, how's everything? I mean, Lori, uh, just so everybody knows, in addition to being executive director of the Golden Gate Restaurant Association, she actually has a number of restaurants herself. Right. So, yeah. So I took over the executive director job in January, anticipating that it was going to be a part time job, which it has morphed into a 60 hour a week, seven day a week job. So, yeah. And before that, um, I'd been involved with the Golden Gate Restaurant Association. We represent um, restaurant members, primarily uh, bars that serve food, but anybody with a food component to it, uh, the bona fide eating establishment term you'll hear. Um, and, and basically mostly San Francisco. And as soon as the epidemic started, we freed up all membership. We dropped any paywalls on our uh, Facebook members page. We said we would extend free membership for all of our restaurant members and decrease the vendor member uh, amount just because communication was so important to us and everybody was scrambling. And, and my goal and the restaurant association's goal is to try to save the industry, which I think is still a little a little dicey, but we'll try to take the positive uh, the positive approach to this. But yes, in addition, I have owned and operated restaurants in the city since 2000. Um, I used to have Rose Pistola in North Beach, which we had to close three years ago, and I have Cherzo and Rose's Cafe now, which are currently closed. We're hoping to open in a couple weeks when we get the dine-in uh, okay to go, along with outside seating as well. Okay, so I think the best way to start this conversation is to take a step back and let's uh, maybe get an update of what did the landscape of restaurants look like before the pandemic hit? You know, how many restaurants did we have and, and what did those numbers look like? Yeah, so you touched on it a little bit. So back in September of 2019, when I was starting to get concerned more about the industry before I took on the ED role, we were looking at some Department of Health numbers near the year end that, that said that there's about 3,900, what I'm gonna call brick and mortar restaurants because data is tough in this business, but we know we can track the health department permits. So those are true data. It's not looking at Yelp, it's not guessing, it's how many restaurants have to file for true health department permits. And those permits, the end of 2019, there were uh, about 3,900. And the numbers you quoted were absolutely correct. We'd been seeing openings and closings vary between 12%, 20%, 12% over the lagging five years. But what really concerned us is we were starting to anecdotally see closures happening. And then when we got the numbers and it showed 40% more closures than openings, which was like 152 restaurants, then I was really concerned. And if we take a step back, again, I just want to say, since we're all policy people as well as business people, sometimes policy has good intentions and it has different outcomes, uh, particularly if policy was maybe made without getting as much input from the businesses that one might want to understand the unintended consequences. Wow. So. So back in 2012, there were a number of policies that the city of San Francisco enacted and some were voter policies, such as the minimum wage increase that went up $1 a year uh, from, for five years and then is now going up tied to a, a lagging year's CPI for the San Francisco urban wage owner, owners, um, earners, excuse me, CPI. And so that is what you're gonna see to trigger the wage now, the minimum wage is at 16.07 an hour. 
and the other change that was made. And so what that has resulted in, if you look at your total payrolls, because it's not just the minimum wage, it has the ripple effect throughout the rest of the pay scales of payrolls for restaurants going up by 52% on average. That, that breaks the business model. So I should also mention, I have an MBA and an engineering degree. This is my like second going on third career if we count the policy move. So, you know, I understand the numbers and the numbers for restaurants, payroll used to be about, if you couldn't make your payroll being 35% or less of your, of your P&L, you couldn't make it work. Payroll in San Francisco routinely runs 45 to 50%, right? So for every dollar you guys spend in a restaurant, 50% of that is going to payroll and, you know, benefits, which includes the healthcare, because that was the other change. The healthcare security ordinance that went in has, has um, a very large effect. And that, and that um, effect is basically roughly, um, uh, basically $2 an hour for the smaller restaurants under 100 employees up to $3 and eight cents an hour now. So um, that's the that's the difference. Yeah. So you're looking at, you know, minimum wages of between eighteen dollars and nineteen and a half dollars per hour, which, again, we're not arguing if that's a fair wage or not. I'm just saying that sort of breaks the uh, the restaurant model. So, yeah, I mean, certainly. I think anybody's salad went up 50% in prices in the last Well, yeah, so that's the interesting point is you would think that we would all raise the prices and a lot of us just haven't done that, me included. Now, I think going forward, we can talk about some of the things we might expect to see and people will do it one of two ways. Either they'll pivot from a, a higher end, more complicated food to more of a comfort food and maybe drop the prices and try to pick up that difference in volume, which is gonna be different um, and difficult to do perhaps because of the limited um, capacity that you're going to see in effect in a restaurant due to the social distancing protocols. So, so anyway, it was a difficult situation before. COVID certainly has wrecked damage to this industry. I can quote some numbers. There's been some new polls out um, from Compass Lexicon that is expecting up to 85% of all independent restaurants will close if there's not another tranche of aid across the United States. Um, a McKinsey report had a similar result, 20% um, to survive. Um, the James Beard Award, uh, James Beard Foundation uh, did a, a poll a couple months ago. They, were, they saw the same thing in New York, one in five restaurants expected to survive. So what do we need to change that? We need a lot of things. We need to open sooner, which we're not doing. We're lagging pretty much everybody due to safety concerns, which I agree makes sense. And then we're also um, needing federal aid and significant amounts of federal aid. And we can come back to that later. But. Okay. And one thing that I think is really helpful for the audience to understand is we probably have most of San Franciscans that are joining. Does it look like this in every major city? Are we an anomaly in terms of, you know, what the industry was facing already? We were worse than a lot of industries just due to the costs. And again, I'm not, I'm not making a policy statement here, but due to the cost of the policies we enacted. So we are, and I, I tried to confirm this today on a, a policy call with a friend from DC. I believe we are the only city in the United States to have an ordinance such as the healthcare security ordinance. Now I could be wrong. There are some similar ones, but they are not enacted exactly the same at the same rate at the same multiplier. Yeah. So. So our costs are definitely higher here. Um, New York might be similar, and New York obviously saw more devastation than we had with the COVID situation. So I'm afraid we're, we're going to see a, a, a bad outcome for, for New York independent restaurants unless we can get some significant additional financial help. Okay, so with that dire <laughs> kind of statement, you know, I know that you guys recently conducted a survey of your own owners about, you know, what does the situation look like on the ground right now? Could you mm -hmm. share a bit more about what you found? Right. So we conducted a survey. It, we dropped it May 5th. We tried to share it out to everybody, had it translated to Spanish and Chinese. We got about, about 220 responses, which represent about 440 restaurants, something like that, which is... Not a ton, right? Knowing that there was between 3,600 and 3,900 restaurants, depending on how many fell off in the first quarter of the year. And um, of those, I think that we saw the most connected folks answer the questionnaire because 
nearly two thirds of those that answered uh, in May had already received a PPP loan. So the payroll protection program loan, which is a, a fairly complicated application. And then you had to find a bank. And so what that told us was the folks that replied to the survey were comfortable online, were probably more technically competent, were our members who were getting a lot of information. We've been sending two to three uh, weekly communications, posting on a Facebook members page, as trying to share as much as we can. So we probably saw the more connected folks. Of those folks, um, quite a few of them decided to, to stay open for takeout. So out of the ones that we saw surveyed, close to 70% said they were gonna stay open for takeout or delivery or reopen soon, right? So we are already in May, we're like six weeks into the shelter in place. Some people closed right away and then reopened to do takeout and delivery. Of those, 60% were losing money and 30% were breaking even. So uh, not everybody's business model was supported and there's, there's numerous reasons for that, but it wasn't like, oh, we can just pivot to takeout and survive, right? We're going to have to do multiple things, I think you pointed out, to survive going forward. Additional revenue streams, different ways of doing business, those types of things. So roughly about one out of 10 said that they were profiting still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is why we said, let's push the shared spaces program. Let's lobby for that. Let's Let's try to find additional ways that we can get folks to start getting revenue in. And, and I honestly don't think too, I certainly didn't, none of us anticipated we would be in a full dine-in shelter in place three months later. I mean, it, we're gonna do another poll the first week of July and then we'll see what the numbers tell us. But yeah, none of us expected to be closed this long for dine-in. Well, yeah, I mean, this is a once in a century pandemic, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what have, you, what have you been seeing your members doing in response? So a lot of them are switching to takeout and what other types of measures are they taking to, to survive or pivot? Well, I think um, a lot of the, the folks I've been really impressed with are, are some of the more fine dining establishments. They started working with um, SF New Deal, who has been partnering to take uh, charity money and uh, use it um, much like um, Jose Andres has with his World Kitchen to help feed uh, the homeless and to also help feed the first responders. And so many were doing that, getting a small stipend, a small amount per meal that was letting them maintain some of their staffing. Most people did lay off their staff um, that responded as well, of course, and brought a few back on. Uh, the other thing that's super creative, a lot of people built out their, um, their website and they started offering more online options, more like meal kits, more items, sort of more of a grocery store type of a establishment. I know Anthony Strong down at Prairie turned Prairie into a full on grocery store. I know some folks, SF Bistro and Noe Valley did the same thing. There's a lot of creativity with that. There's some, there's some thought that some of that may continue and that goes to some of the the, um, the streamlining regulation that the mayor's office introduced that we supported. So I think that you're going to see things like that. You're also going to see, we'll talk about the expanded outdoor dining uh, footprint that certainly will be available through December. Um, and then, you know, we'll have to see what happens to the menus on the indoor dining, what the options are. Makes sense. Um, yeah. Just a reminder to everyone, I see that, that there's some chat bubbles popping up, but if you have any questions throughout today's chat between Lori and I, please stick them in that Q&A. Okay, so what, um, you know, this is what's happening here in San Francisco with the, the dining outside. What else are people doing around the world to save their restaurants? I imagine these razor thin margins are, are in other cities, right? In other countries. Right, well, I, you know, the folks that have opened, I think have largely tried to utilize the outdoor dining. Um, although yeah. I'm back in Wisconsin and I can tell you there's many states in between where it doesn't look like anything has happened. <laughs> so uh, just a matter of, you know, the state and the, the density. Um, but for sure, outside dining, um, particularly with the nice weather, is something everybody is, is going to. The bars in a lot of places are open. I know that uh, creatively, certainly in Asia and such, there's a lot more um, 
use of, you know, trying to have more preventative measures than I think we'll see in the states with the contact tracing, with more of the temperatures. I don't expect that we'll be taking temperatures in San Francisco. I could be wrong, but I don't expect it. Um, so, you know, you're going to see a different mindset that clearly everybody's more used to wearing masks. Hopefully that will continue in San Francisco. I tell you, we're a lot better than the rest of the United States from what I've seen <laughs> coming back to the Midwest. Um, nobody, very few people wearing masks back here. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, I think things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had my temperature taken for the first time to go eat somewhere last week. In the well, city? No, it wasn't in San Francisco. I was, it was just so, you know, just a surreal moment of, wow, like, it, this is where we're at right now. Like, this is where the world's at. Uh, so that's going to be something that might be confusing to customers and to tourism is that there is no, there's no one mandate, right? So we're going to see differences in Napa versus Sonoma versus San Francisco versus San Mateo versus LA. And it's going to confuse the heck out of people. And I think that that's really going to put a lot of, you know, we're going to need to communicate a lot of burden on us saying, well, this is how we're doing it here. Um, and then of course, folks can always add on, right? So the state sets sort of the, the baseline for us. And then San Francisco is, is setting the bar higher and, and different, you know, cities and states are taking the same thing. It's usually at a county level, and that's why San Francisco is a county and a city, and that's why we're setting our guidelines as we are. That's a good jump off point, actually, is tourism, right? This is something that, you know, if we start to open up again, the number one industry in San Francisco is tourism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a misconception a lot of folks have that I end up, you know, having this talking point often is they think tech's the number one industry. But right. it is still tourism. And, and so, you know, what does that look like? I know one of the things that the, the mayor is really concerned with is if we start to open up hotels and things like that, we could have a lot of, a lot of people coming in that could spread it. Um, right. How does that affect the, the restaurant industry? Well, I, I do think that safety is our biggest concern, right? So safety of the customers, but also safety of our workers. So we want the well-being, everybody to be in concern. And, and that's the trick that the mayor and the business community has been having is try to, and the health department, trying to balance, you know, the economic need with the health need. And I think one of the things that we in San Francisco want to do is to preserve the amazing results that we've experienced, right? Because we closed down early, we're in the lead, in the lead horse position, and we don't really want to go to the back of the pack, right? We want to stay in the lead, in the lead position for multiple reasons. And so I think what we're going to have to do is 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 really ask the public and the dining and the diners and you know you guys might not be the biggest revenue industry but you certainly feed you know you're the people that help come into the restaurants and support the restaurants and we really need you know we need people to come to work in San Francisco and stay in San Francisco and and live in San Francisco and spend money in San Francisco. So We'll get back to that in a second, but we all need to be aware. What we're trying to do is keep the greater good healthy. So that goes for behavior. I've fielded a bunch of stuff today. There's gonna to be a webinar from the city tomorrow. Yes, we rolled out the shared spaces quickly. Yes, not everybody's behaving well, but we all need to sort of, I wanna make a plug, be adults. The goal here is not to close again. The goal is to wear the masks. If you're dining, consider the fact that without a mask on, you know, I'm the diner, you're the waiter, the server. I'm not, you know, you're not protected from me if I'm speaking loudly and projecting spit when you're taking my order. So we all need to be a little aware of that and we need to be, you know, think for the greater good. We're all trying to make this work together. So what percent, uh, and maybe you don't have these exact numbers, but what percent of folks are San Franciscans that eat at San Francisco restaurants versus people that are just visiting. And I imagine Fish and Floor in North, in North Beach, it's, it's different in certain areas. Right, so I was gonna say, I don't, I don't have the overall number, but what I can tell you is that, for example, in the neighborhoods where my restaurants are in Cow Hollow, I would say 85% are locals. You flip wow. that down by Moscone, you flip that by, down by Moscone, and you see a complete reverse. 85% are 
tourist store business, right? Maybe 15% are locals. So you're gonna see the difference across the city and, and that's another concern. Folks that have their restaurants, my, my members and colleagues that have their restaurants in Union Square, in Soma, in, in down by the Moscone Center are gonna see much more delayed openings with a much more precarious outcome until we can get the engine, the economic engine working again. The neighborhoods are gonna have a, a higher probability, I think, of success because people are more likely to be there, to live there, to be working from home, to frequent the restaurants and stuff. So, and we all know we're not gonna see a lot of convention business, at least through the end of the year. Yeah. So, yeah. So we have to talk about how do we support the restaurants because the normal, the normal revenue flow, it's, it's gone. It's like if a tech company lost two thirds of its products, right? I mean, you have to use the same analogy. It's just, how do you run your business? Yeah, so. absolutely. So how rolling up the shared spaces program, I'm just kind of curious because I know everybody always has a battle with, with something um, getting rolled out in San Francisco. How, how was that um, received? How did that happen? Space is coveted in this city. We do not have space. How did you get the space? And how long do you uh, have the space? Well, you know, I think again, a couple of things. I think it, it, was, an, it was a great idea. Um, um, and a lot of people had this idea. A lot of people saw it in, in Europe. Um, and a lot of us that have been to Europe experience it, right? And we're like, hey, let's do something. Now we'll set the weather aside. Um, and so in, in late April, we started to put a, like a little position paper together that said, here's a two page overview of how this could work. And then added some more details after numerous conversations with restaurant owners and food trucks and, and things about what would it look like if we were to streamline it. Now, many folks in the city, me included, have a uh, whole table and chair permit. So you can dine outside, it's permitted, you're paying a huge fee to the city, which we're hoping to get waived part-time here. And then, you know, you can serve alcohol, you can do whatever you want. You've got, you know, limited hours of operation. You've got the ADA barriers, you're, you're compliant. Usually that takes a long time. Architectural drawings go through some public hearings. You pay a whole bunch of money. The inspectors come out, you know, and if, if we followed that process, um, we would be probably in March, right? I mean, pandemic. <laughs> yeah, post pandemic. And so we're all pitching like, is there a way I know we're not like Woodside where there's four, you know, four restaurants and one street downtown, but is there a way we can bring everybody together and streamline it and start with the most obvious for those restaurants that don't have the existing outside table and chair permits? How could they get it? How can we make that a one stop shop? And that is what um, the Office of Economic Workforce Development, big shout out to Ted Conrad, who was throwing this football about a month ago, who amazingly was able to pull it all together and get buy-in. Now, it's not perfect. There's going to be a webinar tomorrow. We're going to try to educate a few people like, yes, you do need barriers. And, and, and there's, you know, we streamlined it, but we didn't say like, it's the Wild West, right? So there's going to be a little bit of, of training and getting things back right and making sure we, we follow the ADA concerns and things like that. But um, yeah, so tackled it from let's let people use the outside sidewalks to let's let them use their neighbor's sidewalk if their neighbor agrees to let, let's park, let's see it in the parking lanes, which was a, to your point, a huge mm -hmm. ask and a huge give. Although I will say in general, I think there is a propensity to be anti-car so like it wasn't that hard. I think there's more people that would like to get rid of cars more than keep cars. And so removing temporary parking spaces wasn't a huge uh, ph philosophical lift, I don't think. I know it, it can cause issues, but I think the thought here is that there's a greater good for the city if we, we do it and it is on a temporary basis right now through the end of December. So yeah. there's that. And then, and then applying for shared spaces for the streets is huge applying to close a street yeah and i i really want to commend you larry on this because you just get a gig like a few months back you know and and I've had this, it's so funny we've done so many of these conversations and i swear every person i've talked to is like so i got the job in january you know <laughs> it's like this is the theme and and to be able to like tackle 
using San Francisco's coveted space to, to you know, serve your members and get legislation passed at, in the city of San Francisco. It's the hardest place to pass a piece of legislation in America. Like we all know it. And so, you know, you just- so, so, so just to make a point, it's not, it's, well, it is kind of legislation. It's emergency legislation. So it's sort of legislation, but there was, there was a huge groundswell of support for it, right? I'm sure you saw the petitions that, that folks were, were uh, signing on to. I'm sure that a lot of the supervisors, they got a lot of great feedback. We worked with Supervisor Mendelman and Supervisor Peskin. I'm on the Economic Task Force. That's the other thing. Yeah. Setting up the SF Economic Recovery Task Force, many were skeptical, I think. Like, what? How can 80 people get anything done, right? But what it has done it is it's created a, a, a process, and I'm an industrial engineer, so I was, I was trained with process, to let feedback go up to the city government and to make it a, um, a safe space, if you will, right? Yeah. To give the feedback. So it's not like, oh, I don't wanna bug somebody in the city who I don't know. It's, and it's also really increased the networking between the trade organizations, the small business, the large, look, I met you. I mean, there's so many people that now we work together, the Office of Economic Workforce Development, the mayor's office, all of the different supervisors, whether we disagree philosophically on something, I've worked with so many more than I would have ever anticipated. Everybody's in a different space psychologically to try to solve a really hard problem. And that has been, I mean, and I've been on the mayor's task force years ago with HTSO. I have never seen this willingness to work together. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely, you know, this, this is a changing time for our city. And, and I think this is a time for us to come together. And this is a time for us to figure out what we want the future of the city to look like. We are at a turning point where if we turn in the wrong direction, there's, it's going to be really hard to come back from it. Right. And so that's what we want to do, right? That's why we need you guys. We need tech and we need the people that tech employs and we need the money that flows from tech because, because otherwise who is going to frequent the restaurants? Who is going to frequent the um, remaining brick and mortar retail places that we have, the entertainment venues, the bars? So I think it's more of a policy decision. So I think the shared spaces, just to close the loop on that, there was a lot of excitement. The city got a lot of positive vibes. I'm sure there's people that aren't happy with it. And we definitely need to make sure everybody is on good behavior, right? I'm 100% for that. But we, we also recognize that we need to do something to help try to save certainly as many of the restaurants as we can. Because to your point, what is a city if we don't have all the components to it, right? And and that's what I really hope as we go through a lot of very difficult budget and tax conversations going forward, that everybody, including our city leaders, takes a step back and looks at the unintended consequences of, of trying to solve short-term problems with perhaps levers that, that might, might backfire on us, right? Yeah. And, and, and we need to really think about that. And, um, we all need to decide, just like we decided that we needed to to rebuild the, the the Market Street corridor many years ago. We need to decide: Do we want restaurants? Do we want small business? Do we want tech? Right? What what do we want in this city, and yeah. and why do we want it? And and then all try to work together to solve it. Yep, yeah. that was very very well said. Uh, I'm going to let's let's jump into some of the the topics that we discussed um, right. earlier. Uh, I know you wanted to talk about some of the barriers right now that are facing the restaurants with PPE and things like that. Can you kind of paint a picture for the audience of what are the short-term issues and then obviously the long-term kind of conversation? So I think one of the short-term issues and, and we can certainly follow up and if anybody wants to reach out to me, you can always email me at lori at ggra.org or Jennifer can share my contact information is you know, we, we need to support financially the restaurants as much as possible. And that question goes to without tech workers and other industry workers, not just tech, coming back into their offices for a prolonged period of time, I would imagine, right? And certainly in larger numbers, let's just say, um, how can folks who are working from home, how can they support the restaurants? You know, could there be a per diem type of a situation? And each tech company has its own challenges financially. I totally get that. That you could say, hey, Jennifer, you get to spend $30 a day to go to, you know, Rose's Cafe 
and, and expense it or whatever you do that could help let, let you, the employee, and essentially have a way to continue to give back um, to the community. So that's one idea we're starting to discuss and float and try to come up with a campaign around the, the Golden Gate Restaurant Association leadership is working on that right now. And that's something we'd love to get your guys' thoughts on. Does that work? Does it not? Is there a different way to do it? Because we just feel without that influx of workers out of their homes that there is less um, economic uh, activity going on, if you will. So that's one thing. The other thing is, certainly as we, we've seen it with uh, outside dining, we're going to see it more with inside dining. We're going to need masks. Our employees are going to need masks that are clean every day. Maybe um, shields if you're a dishwasher, certainly um, aprons, uh, sanitizer, wipes. Um, I know you threw out contactless payment. Uh, for example, I have a legacy old NCR system. I'm not going to spend the money to do a new one. So some of us will do it, some of us won't. But certainly there'll be, you know, cleansing, disinfecting things that we'll need. And all of those costs add up. And we're expecting to be like, even if it's a six foot distancing and we're still a little unclear if we can add the impermeable barrier to shorten that distance, I am guessing a 35 to 40% of a normal capacity. So instead of walking into a restaurant at 7.30 on a Saturday night and seeing 80 seats, you're gonna see 40 seats, right? 40 people. And restaurants, they can't really run on that margin. That's why the shared spaces was important. So. We've been trying to see, is there a way, again, that there's some sort of subsidy for PPE? I know I saw in 60 Minutes, the city of San Antonio, it's giving all of its restaurants and small businesses free PPE, right? So our city is facing huge economic issues itself, right? So the problem is we need money to, to give stuff to people. But I mean, that's another way maybe tech could help. And I've been working with our friends at the Bay Area Council, thinking about, can we get donations for that? Can we somehow you know, distributed. We have about 60,000 food workers in San Francisco, restaurant workers, 60,000. Um, so even if you spend, you know, $7 each and, and you know, that's 420,000 and then they would have two masks each if you have the reusable masks, right? So the money's not huge, but if you push that on an independent restaurant and that adds up to 200 a, a week or something, that's gonna be a cost that's you know, pretty significant for a smaller restaurant. That's the other thing I wanna say is about 88% of our restaurants in San Francisco have less than, keep at the top line, less than 2.5 million in revenue. 2.5 million in revenue, you guys. I mean, that, that should blow your mind. That should blow your mind. We're not talking, you know, yeah, there's, maybe five, there's about 500 restaurants that are over 2.5 million in revenue in this city. And some of them have multiple units and things like that. 2.5 million in revenue is a little amount of revenue, right? And if you keep four to 6% of that, that's not very much. So we, we want the restaurant culture, the food culture that we have in San Francisco. These are restaurants and businesses that didn't have a lot of earned income. That's not the restaurant model. It's a pass-through model. People at most had a couple of months, um, me included. I could have done a better job. I was like, I shouldn't have distributed, you know, to the investors, the checks. But, you know, you didn't expect the music to stop. We yeah. none of us expected the music to stop. And, and it took a little longer probably in tech to see the decline in, in, in the sales. But boom, March 16th, the music stopped. So yeah. how can we help support our favorite restaurants or can we roll it up to a higher level and do a, a you know, distribution model for, for masks? They don't have to be N95 masks. They, they can be surgical masks. They can be cotton reusable you know, masks. How do we do that? That's another ask. And then I think um, you know, working together from an industry perspective, like we've all been doing, a lot of us have come together as organizations. How do we all work together to help address the concerns of the budget shortfall, right? Like what makes sense? How does that work? How do we get more business? How do we assume, or how do we help assure that there's not a, a, an exodus out of this city, right? That yeah. to your point, what you led with, the quality of life helps determine whether, you know, folks wanna work and live in San Francisco. Yeah. You know, we need these restaurants to continue to operate. And to your point, it wasn't like they were bankable necessarily six months before this. It was, it was a struggle still, right? So. 
you know, I would say certainly in terms of these segments, I know that we've got folks that are tuning in from some of our member companies. So please, you know, listen to some of Lori's uh, ideas and you can always reach out to me. Or Happy Lori. to have any conversations. And, you know, if people think, oh, that doesn't make sense. Does this make sense? You know, let me know. I mean, we're, we're open to everything. I mean, my biggest, my biggest desire is to try, try to help communicate right now. I mean, certainly there's a lot of different guidelines and hurdles for reopening that we need to just try to share and disseminate in an understandable way, a clear way. Um, to people that aren't used to reading, like I say, OSHA level, you know, language. I was like, I read the first thing and I was like, no, 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 no. This has to be much more clear. I mean, I was like, I don't want to read that, let yeah. alone follow what that said, you know? <laughs> so the city's doing a better job. We're getting like a two page thing, a questionnaire posted. You're going to see a lot of posted things that are going to be required. Um, but yeah, I think, I think cost, I think any help with any tech, um, I think, uh, you know, I think you are going to see a lot of use of the QR codes. I think that'll be one way to go for sure. Um, you know, and then, and then we'll see what else comes out of it. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize, um, you know, the music really, the music really did stop for some, for some of our members, certainly, because especially if you're in gig economy, you were oh, in gig economy for sure. Yeah. But, but one that I learned a lot about was a lot of like CRMs, like customer service platforms and softwares and stuff. They really, really heavily rely on small businesses. You know, these, you know, you have this assumption that they have these giant enterprise contracts and that's who, you know, um, pays for all of their software. But in reality, a lot of folks have a large amount of small businesses. And it's been interesting to see, um, you know, folks like eBay and stuff like that. They've gone, they're now taking their lobbying power and going to DC and going to the Hill and they're lobbying on behalf of the small businesses instead of tech because of how intertwined these two industries really are. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. And, and that's one of the things I've been able to participate in is the independent restaurant coalition that Tom Colegio and Thomas Keller and will, uh, Giardia, I can never say his name, Giard, Giardia. Um, he, uh, they've done an amazing job lobbying for the PPP fixes, um, the payroll protection program fixes to allow it to be usable for the rest of the year. Um, working on a restaurants act, which is a follow on fund to help uh, provide grants for smaller restaurants, uh, groups under 20 units. So yeah, I think everybody realizes, like I say, I, I feel like before it used to be more siloed, like, oh, well, you're healthcare and you're tech and you're like small business and oh, you're the merchant corridor and everybody, everybody got like divided somehow. And now we all need to say, look, everybody's part of this ecosystem, right? I mean, it's like, if you don't have, if you don't have small business, if you don't have restaurants, if you don't have tech, if you don't have hospitals that can sustain, sustain themselves, and the rental, the whole rental and commercial space, I mean, we don't even want to, you know, that's, that has to stay there too, you know, I mean, oh my God. So yeah. it, this is a hard problem and it, it really requires all of us to work together. And I think it requires us to all work together with the city government and realize that not everybody understands everything. Just like you said, like who would have thought a lot of the tech companies had tons of small customers, right? So there has to be education, like, hey, we're, we're trying to accomplish this. But did you understand it really works like that, right? So yeah. I think the, or at least I, I hope, I know certainly for from our industry perspective, the us versus them, the you know, pitting industry, the silos, I mean that's that is so done. done. That is yeah, so done. wildly done. We're done. And, you know, it couldn't come fast enough. It sucks that it took a pandemic to get there, but you know, we certainly hope the legislators know that. These are the conversations that are happening. You know, you don't have tech without food. You don't have food without tech. Like this is how we build a city. And I, and I think that that is going to be super important going forward. And then I think maybe we all work together to solve some of the more challenging problems as well, right? The street conditions, certainly from a tourism, a lifestyle, and a business perspective, we've got to fix. We've got to somehow fix. And um, you know, there is willingness to do that. Um, yeah. And again, we're in an amazing shape. We, we've done the best move. I mean, we locked the city down by the end of February, two days after the mayor's emergency declaration, open table, man, we're down 40% everywhere, right? The, the, the reservations just yeah. dove off the cliff. And I think that 
that helped us. So we have a healthy uh, or healthier um, set of a set of uh, people here, and hopefully we can maintain it, and we can open, and we can stay open. I mean, we don't want to open, screw it up, and close because that's like the worst outcome. Yeah, absolutely. That that will guarantee that will guarantee that it won't work. So we want to do it slowly. We want to do it right, and we all want to stay together on it, right? Yeah. So. Absolutely. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, you can stick any of your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll get to those in a second. But Laura, I've got one that I want to throw out to you. Sure. Um, and then I'll read you them. Don't worry. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, all good. <laughs> Could you tell I was reading them? <laughs> yeah, I think you're like, mm. right. I'll <laughs> all good. Um, ghost kitchens. That's the solution? That's not the way. What do you think? Okay. So... This is a more nuanced answer. Um, Politician. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning, right? Um, okay, so ghost kitchens are really basically ways for folks who can't afford or who couldn't afford to open a restaurant space. And you know, it's not cheap to open a restaurant space. It can cost $2 million easy, one and a half to $2 million for a smaller space. And and usually take long, long, long time. Now, we should come back to the mayor's um, new legislation, which hopefully will shorten that by getting rid of conditional use requirements in certain in certain uh, criteria situations. But so ghost kitchens, they're meant to provide a way where somebody could rent a smaller footprint, right, and then produce out of that footprint. And that footprint has the infrastructure already there and the overall permitting over there. You'd have to own your own permit for your specific activity. But that would be a way to get into the business without a huge capital investment and without a huge time frame. So I don't feel personally that they're fundamentally bad. They're just more like a micro restaurant, right? Maybe we should call them micro restaurants. Ghost kitchen is just like an apartment building, right? And so you're renting an apartment in that apartment building. Doesn't mean apartment building's bad. Now, do we want regular restaurants to go away and ghost kitchens to only exist to offer delivery? Yeah. Probably not. But again, there is a whole ecosystem that one has to have. And if we create an environment where business people who have access to funding do the math and say, I can't open a business and run it in the red, right? We're not the federal government. If we open a business and if we can't pay back, yeah. That business, we will go bankrupt and, and nobody wants that. And so I think much like when there's a need, businesses develop. I think that's why ghost kitchens have come to pass in San Francisco is because the cost of getting into a 1,500 to 2,000 square foot restaurant or even a 500 square foot restaurant it has gotten higher and higher and higher to the level where it's, it's um, been a bigger hurdle than it was certainly in the past. Yeah, absolutely. I will say... Most of the vegan food you find these days in the city is out of those little ghost kitchens. Right, because, and that's the other thing is that you don't have to have that big of a footprint. You don't have to have huge revenue to cover all your rent and cover all your PG&E and all your water and your ecology and your fixed costs on your labor, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a micro business, basically. It's a micro restaurant model. Yeah. I they need it. to rebrand it. They need to rebrand it. Yeah, it's pretty stigmatized. Ghost kitchen, you know. I don't know where that came from. I, I don't like that name. Somebody that didn't like them, I think, named them that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get to a couple quick questions. Um, so here's a good one. With the loosening of some policies, do you think that there are any dangers in doing that? How long do you think the, use, the loosened policies will continue? Loosened policies in terms of, say, the shared spaces and the permit situation? Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so again, um, there's going to be a webinar from the city tomorrow that's going to talk about some things that maybe people should be doing with the shared spaces that might have just gotten missed in the urgency to reopen and have might have contributed to a bit of a Wild West feel in certain neighborhoods. Um, we want to reel that back. So when you streamline stuff, you're not going to make everybody happy, but we're all going to, you know, we were all hoping that people could be adults about this. And if you're running a business, that you follow the guidelines to the best that you can. And if you don't understand the guidelines, you ask me or somebody else for help. And so that is what, um, 
that's what we're going to try to do. I think, you know, in the, in the 10 days since we've allowed the, we, the city, I'm not the city, uh, city has allowed the outside dining. Um, you know, there's probably folks that aren't fully complying. And so we need to clarify that and, and make that better. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping that everybody can demonstrate good behavior. This is a bit of a, uh, you know, kind of like a trial period. It's a, it's a test period where if we can show that the outcome has, you know, a positive net worth, as I like to say, like there's more gain than there is cost, then maybe we'll be able to keep some of that going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. All right. Loris is asking, is DPH planning to add on a new layer of health and safety checks on restaurants that include what their COVID measures are? A new layer beyond the outside dining? I'm assuming so. Yes. So I would expect that, yes. Before we move into, so the next phase is Monday, right? With the, yeah. uh, the 29th, with the uh, hair, with the uh, massages, with the bars. <laughs> we'll talk offline. We'll talk offline. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, there will be some additional uh, clarification. You've seen that the Department of Health has issued work orders and guidance and things like that. The last detailed set that we rolled out was um, the, the morning of June 12th, um, which was the day we were gonna do the outside dining would have been allowed. There will be probably an additional set. We certainly need some more clarity around some of the inside dining stuff. So yes, there will be additional, I, I expect additional uh, Department of Health guidance for, for okay. San Francisco, for San Francisco. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. I always like to wrap these things. I actually always ask a restaurant question. Fun oh, no. This is not specific to our talk, but um, tell me real quick off the top of your head, you can't say your own, which restaurant are you most looking forward to eating at when they reopen? Oh boy. Most looking forward to eating at. See, I don't wanna, I don't wanna like, you know, say anything. I, I will say, I will say this. I will say that for a special occasion, one of the uh, most amazing meals that I had before the COVID thing happened was at Angler. Um, and we had an amazing, amazing dinner at Angler. So I'm hoping that that opens. I mean, I think there's a lot of neighborhood places. I'd love to go to my neighborhood sushi place. Uh, you know, I sushi. I thought uh, like, uh, they said sushi too. Everybody's saying it. I never liked yeah. it before I went vegan, weirdly enough. But yeah, yeah. so no, I, there's so many places we're looking forward to going to when we come back. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Laurie, thank you so much for spending the hour with us. It was my pleasure. I'm hoping that we can get the restaurant industry and the tech industry back in full swing sooner than we know it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm serious about that. If anybody wants to set up conversations, if there's anybody who would love to help donate, solve this, this PPE thing, help some of our folks, I'm, I'm down for that. If there's anybody that has any other ideas. And then as we move forward more of the budget process and, and the, the tax receipts, gross receipts, all of that, um, you know, we'll, we'll all need to work together. But so thank right. you. Yeah, and thanks for your support. All right. Bye, Jennifer. Have a good rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.